Now that family month is coming to an end, next month we start a new series called The Blessed Life. I know many of us have different pictures of what a blessed life means. We've all seen our fair share of posts where someone brags about how blessed they are. It usually involves a photo of them wearing something new, doing something unique, eating something expensive, or going somewhere enviable. But is that really the purpose of life? Is being blessed basically getting what you want and having more than you need? Jesus actually talked a lot about what it means to have a blessed life and what a blessed life is not. Jesus knew that if our main goal was stockpiling possessions, wealth, or passport stamps, it would leave us feeling anxious, confused, insecure, or even afraid. What we have to understand is that when we put God first in our life, everything else will fall into place. That doesn't mean we won't have problems, but until God is first, nothing else can come into order. So I hope you will join us through the month of November as we talk about what it really means to have a blessed life. And just so you know, all of our campuses are gonna be diving deeper into what it is to have a blessed life and going into deeper discussions during the week, diving deep into topics like freedom, peace, scarcity versus generosity mindset, what it means to live a stress-free life. This is such an important topic that all of our campus pastors are going to be leading the midweek group study. Our heart is that on the other side of this series and groups, everyone in our church would have a healthier relationship with their finances and an understanding of why they matter to God. So do yourself a favor, download the Church Center app, take a look at all of your options of where the midweek study groups will be and be a part of the blessed life. I had a conversation back at the beginning of summer and I was talking to somebody and we were just talking about how it seems like, you know, God's doing some great things at the church and, you know, the, the, just some of the stories, the testimonies of some of the things we're already seeing. And uh, somebody said to me, man, you have no idea. And I'd actually a couple of people had said this, but it was in this conversation. Somebody said, uh, man, crazy how it's just from, from nothing to, you know, this community that's really dependent upon each other and the relationships that are being built are so strong. And uh, I said, yeah, it's kind of funny. I said, uh, I'm actually liking being a nobody. <laughs> and I laughed about it. I don't even know why I said that because back in Corona, we could go into the grocery store and I feel like I'd see four people that I know, you know, I'd walk through and knew all the cashiers, knew, and I mean, there's 10 different grocery stores there. So it wasn't like we were in the same one all the time. It was just, I grew up there was there, spent a lot of time and poured a lot out into that area. But now we're someplace new. And I thought, yeah, you know what? It's funny. Being a nobody is uh, really turning out great. <laughs> it really is. And you know, I, I, uh, I thought about it. And it, it, I said that and I thought, where'd that come from? And then I started thinking about it. And I thought, you know, God uses nobodies all the time. And if you look back in Scripture, it's almost always who he used. He always used the nobody. And let's face it, we're all nobodies in the beginning anyway. Even if you're somebody now, at some point, you started somewhere. You started somewhere. And today, I feel like this is the true message of my heart. This is the true depth of what I believe God has called each and every one of us to do and to be. Is a nobody. And for many of us in this room, we say, well, man, I, I don't, I guess, I don't think I could consider myself a nobody anymore. Like, I've worked really hard to get to where I'm at. I've sacrificed a lot to fight for the things that I have and to take care of my family and to maybe get to the position that you always wanted. I mean, you went to school, you started somewhere, and now look. And that takes a lot of work, and that takes a lot of effort. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know what they say. Hey, a penny saved is a penny earned. The early bird gets the worm. Or how about this one? 
early to bed, early to rise makes you healthy, wealthy, and wise. I'm not sure if that's true, but hey, that's what they say. Anyone got a bunch of those little sayings out there? Right, that you grew up on. Maybe it was, maybe it was a, a family member that in your house was those things. Well, my house was always those sayings. And now there's dad jokes everywhere. But, you know, when you think about that phrase, that's what they say. Where did that come from? Where did the that's what they say come from? I think, personally, obviously it's just a saying. It's just a little thing that you hear sometimes, but I think that it was a way for us to say that's what they say and laugh about it because you would never say, well, that's what they say, right? You got to be careful how you say that. That's what they say. Any way you put it is going to do what? It's going to put a little divider between you and them, put a little separation between you and them. So when we say that's what they say, it's a joke because it's not pointed towards anybody because if it was, it would be offensive, wouldn't it? Because it symbolizes division and separation. Truly, when we say they, them, it points to opposition, points to an opposing place. Yet, so much of identity in this world today is changing. So many of people are finding identity in the things that we would never say in the past. Like I would never say a they and them, but yet now there's many in the world that are finding their identity in those words. And I'm not talking about just social and cultural issues. I'm talking about the division that we're seeing in our world today. And it's happening now in our own homes If the enemy can't get us to divide outside of our homes, then he's going to work on our marriages. He's going to work on us as parents. He's going to work on us in the most vulnerable places in our lives, the places that mean the most. And yet some of us might say, well, you know, I I think the enemy of ourselves is ourselves. And you might be right in many ways. We're our worst enemy because we're the ones who keep thinking that we can get it together, we can figure it out, and we can do all this. And there's, is there really an enemy out there? I mean, is there really a devil out there? Is there really Satan out there? But I gotta ask you something. If you believe in a God that's not just sitting here with us, maybe he's sitting here in spirit, but if he's out there and he is a true spiritual entity that created all things, then you believe there's an enemy out there as well. I heard something in one of our men's Bible studies a few weeks ago, is that he's, he's either Lord over all things or he's Lord over nothing. So when we truly believe that God is the source of all things, then we know that his word is true. And if we know that his word is true, then there's an enemy out there that wants to kill and destroy and divide and conquer. And he's doing a great job at it right now. See, the enemy would like us to claw our way to the top, separating ourselves from anyone and everyone being the best and the most powerful. And you know what's funny? I don't believe that any of us, and I believe that for the most part, nobody out there truly desires to hurt everyone to get to where they want to get to. I don't think anybody has this thing that I am just going to destroy everybody in my path to get to the top because that's their true desire. They just want to destroy people. See, I think it comes from this idea that we just want to be somebody. We want to have some value, some worth, something to offer the world around us. We want to know that what we do matters. And yet, I've found in my life right now, That it's been that way all along. That being a nobody is exactly what God has maybe called us to. I want to look at the definition of nobody. The definition of nobody is a person of no influence or consequence. And man, that feels like 
no influence. I can understand that. There's probably plenty of us in this room that say, well, I don't know how, I don't know how much influence I have over me, people in my life. I'm kind of the introvert. I do my thing. I go about my day. I don't really influence many others. But of no consequence, that's another thing to talk about because no consequence, that would mean that nothing I do matters. That would mean that nothing I do has any impact anywhere, even on myself. And that's when life begins to feel meaningless. And that's what the enemy would love for us to think is, is that if you're not somebody, then you have no meaning and you have no purpose and no value. I want to read something to you and I'm going to ask this question. What's the most valuable thing in this world? What is the most absolute when it comes to value in this world? What is it? What's the most valuable thing you can think of? I'll give you a hint. It's not the history supreme super yacht worth four and a half billion dollars. Or Antilia, the two billion dollar home in the heart of Mumbai. Or for some collectors, the card player's painting with a price tag just north of a quarter of a billion dollars. It's not the victorious feeling of accomplishment lying on the other side of graduation or the long-awaited landing of that dream job so if it's not a tangible item we're talking about here, then what kind of inner developmental perspective could it be the most valuable thing in this world? Surely it couldn't simply be the idea of simplicity and appreciation or the marching to a different drum mindset that brings strength and virtue to inner worth and confidence, could it? No, see, I'd, I'd put a strong bet on the idea that most of us truly know that love is the most valuable thing this world has to offer. Love is absolutely the most valuable thing that we could possibly have in this world. I mean, you could frame it analytically because if you love something, what do you do? You do whatever it takes to take care of it and to foster it and to nurture it. So then if you receive love, then you get the same thing in return, right? So love's value is never ending. Love is supposed to be never ending, except we kind of see it a little bit differently. We think of love and we think of like romantic relationships and we think of falling in and out of love. And we think, well, once it's gone, it's gone, right? Well, yeah, if you stop loving, it's gone. But I think we forget that love is an action. It's a verb. It's something we do, not just something we feel. Yeah, the hope is you feel it as well. But it's something we do. The every bit of this life, every bit of its purpose and its reason is based on love. You know, our, the scripture that defines Christianity, if, if you were to pick just one and you say, okay, well, what is the, what's the most popular scripture out there? I, I, my bet is it's going to be John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. It doesn't say for God was so disgusted with the world. It doesn't say that for God was so grieved by the world that he gave his only begotten son. It said for God so loved the world. He so loved this world so much that he gave up his son. And in essence, he gave up his heavenly home to join us here. He gave up everything that was there so that he could be with us. He so loved. And his desire for you and I is to be the absolute best version of ourselves, a representation of his love. I want to read to, from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And there's a good chunk of this that many of us know, but 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 1 through 7 starts like this. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. I am nothing. <laughs> now it says here that without love, you're of no influence or no consequence. I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give 
over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. And let me stop there for one second. What Paul's writing in here is, is that no matter what I do, no matter if I have all of it seemingly put together, but if I don't have love, none of it matters. And then he describes love. And most of us have heard this. If you've been to a wedding, you've probably heard this, right? Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. But it can only be found in him. And I think the the sobering part about it more than anything is, is that, you know, God says pretty clearly that you're either for me or you're against me. He's either Lord over all things or he's Lord over nothing. And I know we would like to think that it's, it's just easier to say, well, I, I could give him some of my stuff and I'll deal with this other things that I'm dealing with. And you know what? There's going to be seasons of that. There's seasons of that for all of us. There's times when he's got part of me and I'm holding on to the other part that I'm like, Lord, I know I'm trying to figure this out. And he's like, yeah, well, I'm just trying to tell you to let go. That's all. But what if it's truly that? What if it really is that? That if we give him everything, that if he is Lord over all things, then he will be Lord over all things. Then we can actually trust him with all things in our life. He says we're either for him or against him. He says you can't serve God and mammon. And some people like to switch that word mammon with money, right? Even some of our translations say you can't serve God and money. You've heard it. It sounds like a a quote in the past, but we were talking about that a few weeks ago, and I was with a couple friends of mine who pastor, and some who are leadership in church, and most who have been just raised in it, and kind of like the idea of giving and all of that is is pretty normal in our lives. For some, it's like, hey man, mm -mm, don't touch my money. Well, what if God's not talking about money when he says mammon? See, I was looking at it And the question was, with the bunch of people that have been raised in it and have heard it a million times, maybe not a million, but what is mammon? What does that truly mean? See, mammon was the god of prosperity in Babel. And there's some other things that it can allude to, but you have to look a little bit deeper to actually figure it out when you think about this. The idea of the Tower of Babel, anybody remember that? They were trying to build it to get as high as they could. They wanted to reach the heavens. It's crazy. We kind of do some crazy things in life, right? But they wanted to reach heaven. So they thought, we're going to build it and we're going to get there. What was the intention? The intention, what was, what's wrong with the intention? They just wanted to get to God, right? But the way they wanted to get to God was the problem. And they thought that if they got to the top, that everything would work out great. That if we got to the top and we got to the heavens up there, then we would have it all and nothing would be wrong with our lives. We would be completely secure. My guess is is that mammon, a better word to secure it out or to switch it out with would be security. That mammon is a security that we seek to find without God. That we think that we can figure it out without him. We think that we can get it all together and make it happen and then we don't really need him. But it doesn't matter how much you have or what you attain or what position you get to or how high you get on the ladder. It never fulfills anything. It fulfills a bucket list maybe. It fulfills a list that maybe you made of that here's where I got to get to. But I think anybody who has gotten to a good place in life and feels secure in life would tell you, man, I'm still missing a whole lot. And then they know that if they've got a little bit of Jesus in them, then they know that, yeah, well, lucky thing I have him because otherwise 
I don't know what life would be like. Pastor Moses shared that next month our series is The Blessed Life, and I know that a lot of what he was talking about was kind of the financial securities and those type of things. But I, I, and yes, of course, those principles will be there, but I, I believe that that security, that finance is just a small part of that. We think of it as the biggest part of it, but it's such a small part of it. It's what's in here that we're trying to get to and not allowing God to give it to us. See, I believe that to get away from this idea of serving God and mammon and trying to figure out that, well, wait a minute, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm not totally for him, I'm against him, what does that mean? I'm trying, man. <laughs> it just means that we surrender and serve. That we surrender all of it that we have. You don't have to take everything and go, okay, well, what do you mean? I'm supposed to start over now? No, absolutely not. Take where you are, what you've done, everything you've accomplished, and surrender it to God. Use it to serve his purposes and see what happens. See what happens with what you've already worked so hard for. See what God does with what you have if you surrender and serve the kingdom with it. Again, that's everything. That's time, talent, treasure. It's all of the above. Some of us in this room would say, hey, man, I'm not much of a surrenderer. (laughs) I'm kind of the guy who's like, if you tell me I need to surrender, I'm going to fight through it. I'm a good fighter. I'm a good fighter. Not, I'll fight through a lot. I'll keep going and keep going and keep going. And I'll say, hey, I'm not going to burn out. I'm not going to get tired. Do we get tired? Of course we get tired. But some of us are just made to fight through. Some of us believe in this overcomer mentality that says, I'm not a surrenderer, pal. But if we truly think that we're not a surrenderer, that we don't do well with surrender, then I I feel like we might have missed the whole fact that all of us have surrendered to an idea. And if we're the ones who's that, I don't surrender to much, then we've definitely surrendered to the idea that if you get to the top, it'll fulfill everything you need. So we either surrender to an idea or we surrender to a situation. My hope would be that we surrender to God's purpose in our lives. This last Wednesday, there was a pastor's breakfast, and it's, all, it's for the South Bay pastors, and it was um, a whole bunch of us because it's Pastor's Appreciation Month, and so they're like, hey, you know, you guys come. We got a little gift for you, so everybody shows up for the gift, right? Well, for me, our central meetings are every other Wednesday, and they always fall on the last Wednesday of the month, so I can never make it to the regular Wednesday breakfast. I've been once, and this last time was the second time I've been, and there was probably almost 60 pastors there. And it was pretty incredible. I got to sit at a table full of a bunch of pastors in the area. We talked a lot about things. and There was a gentleman that shared a message with us, and he was 79. He was about to turn 80, and he shared some things with me before because he's actually found out that knows my dad <laughs> through ministry and different things. And he's like, I saw that last name. He's like, you know John and Edie Boss? That's my dad and mom. <laughs> and so uh, we had a great conversation, but one of the most powerful messages I've heard in a long, long time. And he brought up the idea of Jeremiah the prophet, kind of shared Jeremiah's story. And I'd have to say that Jeremiah has always been my personal favorite prophet. One, because, well, they, he's the weeping prophet, so does that make sense? All right. <laughs> He's the weeping prophet, so since I'm emotional almost all of the time, I feel like, hey, okay, we got a little bit of a kindred spirit, Jeremiah and I. And then here's the other one, is, is that if you look him up, many things will call him the second greatest prophet in history, which also hits my heart. I share with you that idea of nobody, and it's kind of the base of where I'm at right now, and what I feel like God's doing in the church. And so I started writing a book not long ago about being a nobody. And there'll be five steps to being the second greatest nobody the world has ever known. Think about that for a moment. The greatest nobody that the world has ever known would have to be Jesus. The Bible has sold more books in history than any other book, and by far. 
Jesus, just about everybody on earth knows the name of Jesus. And if they don't, the goal of many is to make that happen. So I would have to say that Jesus being a nobody, born in a barn, a manger, to just a young girl and a young man, became a carpenter. He was just a kid, a true nobody, yet will forever change the world and will continue to until he decides to return. And see, Jeremiah the prophet was a nobody turned somebody. When he was a kid, God called him and he said, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm too young. I'm just a kid. I can't speak for you, Lord. And he said, no, you will speak for me. So Jeremiah answered the call and he became the prophet to the King Josiah and he was loved and he was listened to and he had the word of the Lord and then all of a sudden the kingdom started doing some things they shouldn't and so Josiah's son and generations and generations and generations decided not to listen to God and so Jeremiah was hated. Jeremiah tried to preach and preach and preach and he was still hated all the time. So he was a nobody turned somebody and then a nobody again. And then by the end of it all, God restored the generations because Jeremiah stayed the course. Jeremiah knew what God had called him to do and he didn't leave it. Did he ever have doubts? Did he ever have times that he held on to things? I'm sure he did, just like any of us. I'm sure he had moments where he was trying real hard to keep it together. And God was like, no, 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 no. I believe that if God had a mission statement, I think it would go something like the last shall be first, the least the greatest, and the nobody somebody in the kingdom of God. And many of us who maybe have been in church for a little while, Anybody have a, have a scripture that you feel like is your, your personal scripture? Like, that's your scripture. Like, if somebody says, like, hey, do you have a scripture? And you're like, oh, yeah, I got mine. My bet is probably 25 to 30% of those who follow Christ would say that Jeremiah 29, 11 is probably their scripture. It's a, very, it's a great one. And you know what? I stand on that one a lot. But I want to read to you from Jeremiah 29, 7. Jeremiah 29, 7 says... Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it. Because if it prospers, you too will prosper. This Thursday at 11, we have a small group of us that pray, but this Thursday we're going to go down and we're going to pray down by the city buildings by the police department and fire department and city hall. We're going to pray. Because Jeremiah the prophet said, before Jesus even came, also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it. For if it prospers, you too will prosper. And then it goes on a few verses later to grab the scripture that many of us call the one that we depend on for our relationship with Christ. And it says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Many of us would love for that scripture to be the one that we depend on God in. And we say, you know what, I'm holding on to that. But just a bit before that, he says, seek the prosperity and the peace of the city in which I've brought you to. Because if it prospers, you too will prosper. See, they go hand in hand. It's not just about us. It's not just about where we get in life and what we experience in life. It's what we bring to the table. It's what we use. What we have to bless others with and to bless the world around us with. He said his plans are good, but he also said you gotta pray for your surroundings so that you will have good plans, so that you will prosper. I think that God's blessings in life and God's goodness in life, his grace and his mercy will always be there. Your salvation is secure. 
but to truly have his promises happen in our lives. We have to surrender. We have to work out that salvation with fear and trembling. We have to continue to pursue him, seek first the kingdom and all things shall be added. That scripture is talking about worrying about the things that you need. It's talking about, hey, you're worried about clothes, you're worried about food, you're worried about all these things. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added. Constantly, God says, if you're worried about anything, it does not matter what it is, tangible, mental, physical, spiritual, if you're worried about anything, seek first the kingdom and all those things shall be added. See, I believe that Last week, just like when Ephraim got up here and because I told you guys, get up and scream for him, shout for him, he got a huge welcome and he got appreciated. I'm sure you would have given him a great welcome anyhow. When we were in Corona, Pastor Adam did a video too, but they had a little video before that kind of showed, oh, what name was coming and it was me and all of a sudden the place lit up and they were screaming like we were celebrities and I was like, what in the world, man? And I came out, of course, you know, brings me to tears and I think, man, you know, the reputation that we have there, the image that we have in Corona, the relationships that we've built is all because it's, everything was surrendered to him there. I've failed a lot in my personal life and being a father. I don't say all the right things. I try. But I'll tell you something. The one thing that I knew that I used to share with our worship teams we used to have, we had 89 volunteers in our worship department back then. And I used to share with them all the time. I know that we got stuff. I know that we deal with things. But don't bring it up here. And I didn't mean the platform. I meant wherever God has called you to, don't bring it there. Yes, we deal with our struggles. We deal with the things that we have. But when it comes to what he's called you to do, allow him to be in complete control. And that's when we see the best results. I said that being a nobody has been one of the greatest times in my life. This has been an incredible season for us. I can't tell you how much we appreciate you guys. I wouldn't be able to find the words. I say plenty of times, I look out and I think, what are you doing here? (laughs) And I mean that with all my heart. Because yes, this stuff means the world to me. Every bit of this is truly what's in my heart, but it doesn't change anything unless God is in charge of it, unless he's in control of it. He is Lord over all things or he's Lord over nothing. That's the way I look at it. I have to give him everything. We have a purpose today, folks. Not just our own personal families, but the family of God in general. And I believe it coincides. I've shared that the last few weeks. When you're struggling at home, the family struggles. And when your family's struggling and you're a part of this family, guess what? We feel it too. I told you this morning was heavy. I had three conversations this morning that unbelievable to think of that hardships can be so difficult that sometimes life just seems meaningless. It'd be better if we weren't here. Kids are saying that. Teenagers are dealing with things that they should never have to deal with at this age. The world's got them thinking that anxiety and depression and all these mental health issues are the reason for all of their little problems right now. And they're just kids. So much ahead. And then you get to those of us who've gotten pretty far in life. And now we wonder, what's the purpose anymore? And you talk to somebody, had somebody tell me that their father was saying, well, what if I just disappeared? What? A regular man, just a regular guy. What if I just wasn't here anymore? That's such a prevalent statement now because you know what? The world around us is pretty tough. But we have a purpose we can bond together and support and show that which is the most valuable thing in this world, and that's love. Love is patient. 
is kind. It's not self-seeking. It doesn't envy, it doesn't boast. It doesn't hold records of wrong. It endures all things. It hopes in all things and perseveres all things. The overall purpose of your family is to bond together to better your community. That goes for me and that goes for our family in general. The overall purpose of this family is to bond together to better our community. Every generation and generation and generation and we stay the course just like Jeremiah. No matter if we go through seasons where we don't see results, we continue to stay the course. I'd like to ask ourselves this question. How am I teaching my family to take hands-on responsibility for our community? I think we all know that the best teachers live out what they teach. And the best preachers practice what they preach. And the leaders who actually have followers walk the walk. I think three things if we can keep this in our minds and if we can say, Lord, here's my motto for my family and for what you've called me to do. To surrender all and to serve all and I know that in that I'll see all that you have for me. If I surrender all that I have and I serve all the purposes that you put before me, I'm gonna see all that you have planned for me. And I'm going to see all that you have planned for the community around me. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, we talk about our community a lot, but the funny thing is, is that we are our community. Some of us are new to the idea of church, the idea of a community, a church community, Lord, that some of us maybe went to church years and years ago and we haven't been too happy with the way it looks like. and Now we're back. And Lord, we want to surrender everything that we have to you. Some of us have been in the church for many, many years. And God, we too want to surrender everything we have to you. And then some of us, is, we say, hey, man, this is my first time. Or maybe you've been here a couple times and you say, I, I, I want to learn how to surrender. I want to learn how to serve the purposes of God and I want to see all that he has for me. But I got to start somewhere and I don't know where to start. Well, here and, here and now today, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today and you say, I'd like to start my journey with the Lord. I'd like to start my journey following Christ. And maybe it was a long, long time ago that you thought you accepted Christ in your life and you say, well, I've run so far from it. I got to start over. Maybe today's the day that you say, I'm committed. I'm going to make him Lord over all things in my life, not just some things, all things. And I'm going to trust him. And I'm going to see what he does in my life. If that's you this morning and you'd like to give your, give your life to the Lord with every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm just going to ask you to look up and make eye contact with me so that I can be praying with you, praying for you, and believing for God to do a mighty work. Amen. Hmm. Well, Lord, for those of us just starting, those of us who are in the beginning of our journey, or those of us who've been with you for some time now, Lord, we all need the same thing. We need strength, and we need peace. We need strength to continue the race, and we need peace to know that when it seems like the world around us is hurting, when it seems like the world around us is falling apart, that you are still God. That we can trust you, Lord. I pray for the families right now whose little ones are struggling. Maybe for the families whose little ones are struggling in school, struggling with relationships and friendships and what's going on around them. Lord, we pray for your boundaries of protection, your angels with and your hand upon every one of our next generation, God, our kids, our students. And Lord, we pray for the families that have adult children that might be struggling, that some of us, we wonder, where did we go wrong? What did we do? How come my kids aren't serving you, Lord? Well, God, we ask right now that you would bring home
bring home the prodigals. For those parents who are praying for their kids, Lord, that are living outside of your will, God, or that are just kind of going through life right now, God, we pray that you bring them home. Bring peace to us as parents and bring our kids home. And for the rest of us, God, those who maybe you've been blessing us in this season or maybe our kids are out and they're doing great or maybe there's some in this room that don't have any kids, Lord, and they're just here making it with you. Well, Lord, I pray, God, for each and every one, no matter what our situation is, no matter where we're at, God, that we would be able to surrender it to you, that we would find a purpose in serving what you have for us, God, and that we would see your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray.